Hello and welcome. This is Alan Mendenhall. I am the publisher and editor-in-chief of Southern Literary Review, and I'm joined here with my friend Susan Cushman, an author I have interviewed before, but never by video. In fact, this is the first time the two of us have spoken by video or by any means, and so it's a real honor. Susan, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Alan. This is more fun than email. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Tell, uh, tell, tell our audience about the conversation we were having before we started recording. We were talking about the technical difficulties I had in starting this interview, and you told me a little <laughs> bit about, I think it was your granddaughter, right? Or, oh, yeah. This is funny. Um, two of our kids are in IT. And they live out in Arizona and Colorado, and they and their spouses, all four work in IT. They each have two daughters. So early into the Zoom process for me, when I had to start learning how to do presentations and share screen and all these different things. I called my son Jason because he's technical. I said, Jason, I need some help with Zoom. He said, oh, my company uses a different platform. I'm not really familiar with Zoom. Hold on, Anna can help you. Anna is <laughs> nine years old. So my nine-year-old granddaughter walked me through everything I needed, all my questions about Zoom. And I love that. <laughs> I love it. It's a, it's a, it's a funny, it's a funny world that we're, that we're living in. It is. Well, it is. We're here on the occasion of the uh, publication of your new book, John and Mary Margaret. And as the title would suggest, the lead characters of the book are John and Mary Margaret. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's actually, for, to orient our audience, it's, it's 526 right now. And the book comes out in early June. So uh, this is one of the first interviews I've done with someone where, where I haven't actually read the book yet. So, so I'm, I'm going to get to ask you about, uh, about the premise of the book and, and be, uh, be perfectly authentic in my ignorance this time, oh which boy. is great. But I know, the book, uh, I know the book is set in the 1960s on the campus of Old Miss. And if I'm not mistaken, you are uh, an alumna of, of Old Miss. Right. And I know it involves a, uh, a romance complicated by the uh, uh, historical realities and, and racial dynamics of that time and place. Um, right. But beyond that, I would love to hear uh, sort of the predicate of the book and, 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 and what it's all about. And I'm excited about getting it myself when it comes out in June. Thank you, Alan. Well, I'll start with my book that came out in 2019, Friends of the Library, uh, which you interviewed me for Southern Lit Review about, is a collection of 10 short stories set in small towns libraries in Mississippi. One of those short stories was about John and Mary Margaret. More than one of my readers suggested that I turn it into a novel. They, you know, a short story is you know, maybe 20 pages. It's got a short narrative arc. And they both said, this is a meaty story. We want to know more about, about John and Mary Margaret. So that's what I did. And uh, last summer, well, end of spring and early summer, uh, in the middle of the pandemic and a lot of the, the uh, racial protests that were going on, uh, I thought this is the perfect time to write this book now because John is a black boy from Memphis. Mary Margaret is a white girl from Jackson, Mississippi, where I'm from. And they fall in love on the Ole Miss campus in 1966, mm -hmm. which was not did not go over well, was not well received, as you might imagine. I well, was in this loving, loving v. Virginia would have been 1967, and exactly. I think James Meredith was admitted to Ole Miss in 1962, and there were all kinds of riots, so this is right in the middle of that time period. Exactly. I, I did my research on all of that. In fact, in the back of the book, in the author's note, I, even though it's a fictional book, I cite a lot of references because I did a ton of reading last summer. Uh, some specific to the time and place and some more of a more general nature. Uh, probably the most important book I read was Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, which I consider a master class in understanding race in our country Nazi Germany and India. I mean, it, mm. it's pretty amazing. Uh, there were a lot of other um, resources that helped along the way and helped inspire the book. So like me, Mary Margaret pledged Tridel sorority on the Ole Miss campus in the late 60s um, and, and aspired to be a writer, as I was. And, she, and she's lived in the Bellhaven neighborhood of Jackson, Mississippi, a few blocks from Eudora Welty. 
Well, I lived in that same neighborhood as a newlywed in the early 70s, and I knew where Miss Welty's house was. I might have sighted her at the local Jitney Jungle a couple of times, but I could never bring myself to knock on her door. I just felt like that would be too invasive, even though she was known as the popsicle lady because <laughs> children would knock on her door in the summer and she would give them popsicles. So I thought, what if, now what if are my, are my two new favorite words as a fiction author? You know, you take something nonfiction, especially historical, and if you want to make it fiction, you say, what if? You yeah. know, so what, what if Mary Margaret meets Eudora Welty when she's a teenager in the 1960s in Jackson, Mississippi? And, and she does, and she meets her in the parking lot of the Jitney Jungle because Miss Welty needed help with her groceries. She ends up going over to her house more than one visit and, and, and learning a lot about race issues from mm -hmm. Eudora Welty. Uh, and she's at her house when Miss Welty's article came out um, about um, the murder of um, Medgar Evers. Mm -hmm. And so that's how some of the discussions, and this starts to have an awakening for Mary Margaret. And I was having a, an awakening as I wrote this. You know, um, I have a black son-in-law and two adopted Korean children and four mixed race granddaughters to whom I've dedicated this book. So, you know, when all this stuff was going on last summer, um, and here in Memphis, uh, if I had been younger and it had not been COVID, I would have joined the protest marches. But I didn't feel safe about it due to my age and due to COVID. And so I thought, well, I can have a voice. And I can write about this. But rather than writing it nonfiction, I decided to write it as fiction, you know, and, and to let the historical events, it covers 50 years of civil rights history, oh, wow. John and Mary Margaret, the book does, starting with John when he was a child in Memphis in the yeah. 50s, Mary Margaret as a child in Jackson in the 50s, their time at Ole Miss together, their time apart for almost 50 years, and then um, the way they find each other again. So, you know, it covers a lot of historical ground, which was a whole lot of fun to research. I and bet. I enjoyed doing that a lot. Well, if you knew where I was sitting, I'm, I'm in Montgomery, Alabama, my Montgomery office right now, and directly across the street on this side is the Rosa Parks Museum, and awesome. sort of behind me this way is the, uh, the street corner where uh, Rosa Parks got on the bus. So, uh, there's a lot of a lot of uh, civil rights history right right around where where I sit at this moment. There sure well, is. You, uh, you you raise a question when you talked about how you started writing this book during the pandemic, and I'm just amazed that this is I believe correct me if I'm wrong, but this is your sixth book in five years. Uh, and at least a couple of those are edited, but that is incredibly prolific. How are you producing at this rate? I mean, that's that's, that's absolutely amazing. Thank you. It's actually my seventh. Seventh? Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I got a late start. I was in my 60s when, um, because I was a stay-at-home mom, soccer mom, and all of that. Did some freelance writing when the kids were younger, but I waited until my youngest left for college in 2001 to get serious about things that I wanted to do, and I painted for a while, and then I wrote, and then um, I started working on a memoir which I wrote uh, over a period of years, but I turned it into a novel, Cherry Bomb, my first novel, which came out in 2017. That took about six years to do. And, um, and also that year, my mother um, had Alzheimer's and she was in Jackson, Mississippi. And over an eight year period, I did blog posts about my long distance caregiving um, events in her life and my life. And uh, another reader said, who, who followed my blog said, why don't you turn that into a book? I turned that into a memoir, Tangles and Blacks, A Mother and Daughter Face Alzheimer's. So that came out in January 2017. The novel Cherry Bomb came out in August of 2017. But I kind of have ADD. I've always got to have a project going on or I get bored. So in between that, I put together an anthology, my first of four anthologies that I edited called A Second Blooming, 
Becoming the Women Were Meant to Be. Mercer University Press published that. And I invited 20 women authors to write about second events in their life, mm. a second marriage, a second religious experience, a second chance after incarceration or mm. getting sober, you know, all these seconds. And it was so much fun and so much easier than writing. Oh, I love to organize things. I love to yeah. find people who are good at things and put them together. You know, so that's what you do when you edit an anthology. So all three of those books did come out in 2017, which was really fun for me, getting a late start. Sure. And then in 2018, the anthology was so much fun, I decided to do another one, uh, which was Southern Writers on Writing, uh, University Press of Mississippi, I think. Ed Tarkington reviewed it for Southern Lit Review, and it had 26 contributors, 13 men and 13 women. And I realized when I was putting that book together, I had become friends with Ralph Eubanks, a black author from Mississippi, who's a visiting professor at Ole Miss right now. He contributed one of the essays, but out of 26 essays, only four were by African Americans, partly because I didn't know many African-American writers at that point, and partly because there were two or three I asked whom who I couldn't get a response from because they were, they were above my pay grade at that point. <laughs> but I was glad to at least have four, and that began my friendship with Ralph, uh, which was so important to me because as I was writing John and Mary Margaret, he was one of my early readers. Oh, wow. He and another Black author, Jeffrey Blunt, who lives in, they both live in Washington, D.C., they both read it and gave me incredibly helpful feedback and then wrote beautiful blurbs for the mm. book. Because for a white woman writing about <coughs> civil rights in Mississippi and Memphis, I mean, I know the book is about both a white woman and a black man, but I, I knew I needed help to, to write the, the, the parts of the story that were about blacks. Right, I said the word black. So, you know, one of my questions that these guys were really helpful with was over the decades, when and who says Negro, the mm -hmm. N-word, Black, African-American? When are these terms spoken and by who are they spoken in which times in history? Mm -hmm. You know, that was important to me. I want, I want to be respectful, right. you know, um, to end the book. And so they were helpful in that and, and in other ways in, in writing this book. But because the short story had already happened in Friends of the Library, that was kind of like having a 20-page synopsis Right. You know, it made writing the book pretty easy as far as the plot went. You now I still had to do research and go fill in a whole lot of their backstories, but um, but it was fun. It was so much fun that I've actually thought about another short story in that collection that um, I might expand to a novel. How did you like? How did you take the short story and expand the plot? Did you just have a sense already of where the shorter story might go if it were a longer story or did you just start writing and the story wrote itself kind of thing? A little bit of both. Um, in the short story collection, I created a fictional author. I named her Adele Covington and I had her going on this book tour through the small towns in Mississippi, which I had actually done for mm. my novel Cherry Bomb. And I had her meet these interesting people in each of these towns who all had issues that she helped them with. Alzheimer's, cancer, sexual abuse, adoption, domestic violence, cancer, I might have said that one because I said Alzheimer's. And um, so, you know, all of those homelessness, all of those are, are issues that have touched my life in one way or another. And so I decided I liked to deal because she was a lot me, I decided to keep her on as a narrator for the novel, John and Mary Margaret. And they meet her in the first chapter at a book club in my neighborhood here in Memphis, Harbor Town on the Mississippi River. And I've spoken to the book club here. So I have them meet her there and I have them tell her their story as they did in the short story. So she's, she's a, um, I don't know if you call it a, reliable narrator or whatever, you know, throughout there. So I kept that tactic in and I basically just took each section of it and fleshed it out more and more and more. I don't think I really changed the, the main tra trajectory of the plot. I just, where something was a paragraph, it became a chapter. You know, and the chapters go back and forth between John's voice and Mary Margaret's voice, even though they're in third person. And then they are chronological other than the, the, the opening chapter is 
in present time. And then you go back to the 50s and 60s and it works it all, all the way up. The epilogue is in 2020. Oh, so, yeah. So your process seems to verify the old adage, write what you know. I mean, you've got a character from Mississippi and you are raised in Mississippi. You've got a character from Memphis and you live in Memphis and you're actually using real life events to inspire particular narratives. You mentioned the book club right there in your, your hometown. I find that to be uh, very neat. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's fun and it does make it easier. You know, um, it is fiction, but sure. I tried to stay as true to history as I could wherever historical people and events are. And I think that's fun. The cameo appearance of Eudora Welty, I think makes the book, you know, more fun. In my short story collection, I did that in every town. I remember in Pontotoc, Jim Weatherly, who wrote Midnight Train to Georgia is from Pontotoc. So he has a cameo appearance in that story. It just makes the stories more interesting, you know, to have some real life. And now the events that happened on the Ole Miss campus, there were protests that happened there. The Black Student Union was formed. A bunch of the students stormed the Chancellor's House. There was a huge protest during a concert for the group Up With People mm. in uh, February of 1970. And here's an interesting story about that. Um, when I read about the protest and I read about them in several sources, which I cite in the back of the book, I sat down with my husband because he was at Ole Miss with me. He was actually three years ahead of me. He was actually there in 66 when John and Mary Margaret and me. I wasn't there until 69. And I said to him, didn't we go to that concert for Up With People? He said, yeah. I said, <clears throat> do you remember a protest where 60 black students were arrested and tons of highway patrol cars were there and blue lights and they were taken off to jail? He said, no. I said, well, me either. So then I checked with a dozen other friends who were at Ole Miss then, because some of my early readers from the book were sorority sisters of mine from 50 years ago, because I set some of the scenes in the Tridel yeah. Town. Uh, yeah. So I checked with all these people, and only one of them knew what happened. All the rest of them were like me. They were like, they either didn't go to the concert, or they went and don't remember a protest. This right. this person finally figured out what happened. The concert was two nights and we went to the first night. The protests were the second night. So they didn't happen when we were there. But the fact that they were off of my radar just, um, just confirms the white bubble that I was living in. I was doing the sorority scene. My husband was the president of the senior class at Ole Miss and in a fraternity and studying for medical school, you know, and we were real active in Campus Crusade for Christ. You know, we had our lives going on, but um, they were all within the white community at the time. Yeah. And uh, it, it's amazing how unaware I was well, that all this you, was going on. That's really interesting. It makes you wonder what events that we don't know about today may be historically significant decades from now. It's very exactly. fascinating to think about yeah. it that way. That's, that's course, truly interesting. Uh, of course, there was no internet and there was no social media. Sure. Now, there were articles in the Daily Memphian, the school paper, but, um, you know, and I, I do know a couple of people who wrote for that at the time, and I do have Mary Margaret being a writer for the Daily Memphian. Mm. But so she is very um, social justice aware. And, and her family's not, you know, and she comes from an ultra conservative uh, old money family in Jackson, Mississippi, who just want her to be in the right sorority, marry a doctor or a lawyer, live in Jackson, do the country club life, you know, have children, teach school. That, that's what they want for her, you know, and eventually she does follow most of what they want for a while. So... That's those those why that doesn't last, you know? <laughs> well, that's that's the importance of the dynamic character is watching the change in somebody. And I'm, I'm confident after reading your writing that you have done an exceptional job with Mary Margaret. And I really look forward to buying this book in June and reading it and uh, getting it in my hands over the summer because what a great time, uh, what a great time to to read novels over the summer when the weather's great, you can sit out on the porch and read. And this just sounds like it would be 
the top of my list. So I, I, I can't wait to do it, Susan. And I'm, I'm thank you. That you, wrote you, it. you, you can pre order it either online or at any independent books bookstore, and it releases on June the 8th. And I have two big um, virtual launches one here in Memphis through Novel Bookstore, and that's coming up soon on June the 4th. And that's the one I will be in conversation with Jeffrey Blunt. And I'm really excited about this. Jeffrey is a black author, uh, lives in Washington, DC. He's the author of The Emancipation of Evan Walls, which is a mm -hmm. fabulous novel. Uh, and I met him because we're both published with Kohler Books. So okay. we were on a panel together at the Association of Writers and Writing Professionals in um, San Antonio last April. And Jeffrey was the first black um director at nbc news oh wow for a long time did nbc news today show 60 minutes some of those he directed some of those so i'm really honored that we'll be in conversation at that virtual event june 4th at mm -hmm. novel you know when i found out that novel wasn't doing in-person events i was really sad at first for my launch until i realized aha here's an opportunity to be in conversation with Jeffrey, which I would not have asked him to come from Washington, D.C. to Memphis. And then the same thing happened for my event with Lemuria Bookstore in Jackson, Mississippi, which is my hometown and where part of the book is set. On July 1st, I'll be in conversation with Ralph Eubanks, the other author that I mentioned, and that's also a virtual event. In between there, for two weeks, I'm going on an in-person book tour across to I have five events in South Carolina, then down to Florida, across the Panhandle, Fairhope, New Orleans, past Christiane, Mississippi, back up through Mississippi. So I'm really excited to have like, I think 10 events and during that two week time in person because bookstores uh, are opening up, especially sure. in the smaller towns. Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, and it is nice to be back in person and form some of those bonds that you form with people. Little things like opening the door for somebody or uh, mm -hmm. saying, oh, excuse me, can I get this off your jacket? Or, you know, yeah. pulling someone's chair out for them. Little little uh, uh, pieces of, of uh, subtle communication that we're not even aware we're doing that, that, that right. we're forming bonds. But this is great. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to your book tour and I'm not even going to be on it. So I, that's... That's how you know it's going to be a good book tour. <laughs> I know Montgomery has not been um, in my path for uh, for books in the past. I'm not sure why I, I was at um, thinking in Alabama. I just drew yeah. a blank where um, the courthouse is. Where um, Harper Lee? Yeah, in Monroeville, Monroe, Monroe, Alabama. Right. I, yeah. was, I was at the library in Monroeville uh, for an event about a year ago. So I guess that's the closest I've been. Uh, and, and I've been in um, near Birmingham and Tuscaloosa and Fairhope. So I've been all around you uh, yeah. for various events, but well, haven't had connections in Montgomery. So Well, you've got a connection here, so we should talk about that after we get off this Zoom call, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. That would be great. All right. Well, thank you, Susan. Thank you very much for being here. Again, the book is uh, John and Mary Margaret, and it is uh, releases on June 8th, but you can go ahead and get online right now and order it. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Susan. Thanks for having me, Alan. Thank you.